welcome to Our World Today, ourworldtodaytv.org, um, a progressive political show imagining a better tomorrow. I'm Suzanne Linton. Each week we bring you activists from the Twin Cities to inform you on the issues of our day. And tonight we have, of course, my favorite activist of all time. <laughs> Jeff Nygaard, Always Dave Vicking, my favorite Hi, show. And this is my last show until 2013. Yes, in yes, June. Right, yes. So you'll be yeah, gone we'll for a while and we'll be, be carrying on. Yes. And hopefully, we will carry on, yes. <laughs> while you're gone, there will be some news to talk about. Oh, there might. We hope. Um, right, yes. I know. We hope. Yes. Um, one of the things that, of course, we're, uh, it's, it's now December 2012, so we've uh, known the results of most of the elections for a month <laughs> right. or so. That's Some right. took a long time to figure out, um, including in Florida. But um, one of the things, it was, we talked last uh, on the last show about how startling it was to all of us, actually, yeah. how quickly after the election we started hearing about this thing called the fiscal cliff mm -hmm. and how we had to make hard choices and have adult conversations and sacrifice, sacrifice, yeah. sacrifice, oh. um, and how that immediately became the... Um, the the top of the, the news uh, all over the place. Um, so I think in contrast, I'd like to point out this, this month, talk a little bit about something that um, uh, really has not been in the news at all. And that's uh, so several initiatives from a, a group that some people might not even have heard of called the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's, been, there's long been a Congressional Progressive Caucus. I think it started in 1971. Um, but it's basically a, a, a group, a caucus of, of con uh, congressional uh, representatives that group themselves together uh, as progressives and, and do a number of things. They've been more or less effective over the years, but in the last year or so, uh, the co-chairs of the, um, congressional, the CPC, Congressional Progressive Caucus, have been a guy from New Mexico named Raul Grijalva, and a Democrat from New Mexico, and the other co-chair is Keith, our own Keith Ellison from the mm -hmm. 5th District here in Minnesota. Um, and they've become much more active. They've put out several um, um, uh, statements and proposals in recent months, the last year and a half or so, that I think are very newsworthy, particularly in light of the election, because one of the things, well, there, there's, there's the four things I'll mention. One is what they're calling uh, the deal for all. They're, they're calling it, and it's a resolution uh, passed um, um, in July, I think, uh, that is talking about the, the deal they're talking about is the, the budget uh, reconciliation deal, that what is work, other people are calling the fiscal clear for the, or the grand bargain is the term. Um, the, the, con the, the resolution that proposed by the Congressional, the CPC, uh, called the deal for all, has four, um, they resolved to take, to take four positions on the, the negotiations. The first is no cuts to Medicare, Medicaid, or Social Security benefits. The second one is it must contain serious revenue increases, including closing corporate tax loopholes and increasing individual income tax rates for the highest earners. The third is significantly reduce defense spending to focus cool. the United States Armed Forces on combating 21st century risks. And fourth is to pr promote economic growth and expand economic opportunity by including strong levels of job-creating federal investments in areas such as infrastructure and education and by promoting private investment. Now, I looked in the LexisNexis media database mm -hmm. of major newspapers to see how many mentions the uh, deal for all by the Congressional Progressive Caucus had received in the last three months, and I came up with a nice round number, zero. Oh. Oh. Um, it really literally has not been mentioned. Um, I think oh. what's startling about this, uh, particularly for those of us in Minnesota, a, the, whatever interpretation or spin you give to the election results, there is much polling data and uh, anecdotal evidence to say that uh, these four points are to varying degrees supported by a, a large number of people in the United States as we go forward from the election. Oh, yeah. People aren't using the word mandate, but the fact that in Minnesota especially that we have a, a switched over to a DFL-led House and Senate along with the governor, and that we went strongly in this state for um, uh, the Democratic presidential candidate, and that our Representative uh, Ellison is the co-chair of the Progressive Caucus, 
would lead one to think mm -hmm. that this was deserving of some coverage, some coverage yeah. in the local media. I think on the national level, too, the, the, the idea that there's a... Because the Congressional Progressive Caucus has 80-some members. It's not an insignificant mm -hmm. uh, number out of 435. It's not a majority by any means. Mm -hmm. But um, it includes um, some, some serious people. Um, the... Another thing, and it hasn't been mentioned at all, uh, I looked up another thing that just came out on December 1st. Uh, they, there was a statement put out by the, um, what they're calling themselves the Gang of Six. Uh, six of the uh, members of the CPC put out a statement on the framework for tax reform, specifically tax reform. And they have some corporate tax reform principles, um, promoting corporate responsible corporate behavior, uh, t talking about the global system that works for American people, reducing the tax code's bias toward overseas investment, and uh, saying no to what's called a territorial tax system. I think people haven't even heard of. That's a proposal by international, mu multinational businesses that taxes only be levied against profits made in the United States. So oh. foreign profits of U.S. corporations would be completely exempt forever. Uh, so they're opposed to that. Things like that. And they also have some individual income tax, tax uh, individual tax reform principles, restoring progressivity, fair rates on wealthiest taxpayers, uh, adding additional tax brackets, not just one for above $250,000, but a millionaire and a billionaire tax, which was proposed by Representative Jan Schakowsky, a member of the CPC. And... Um, House Resolution Number 1124, and uh, re-examine expenditures, tax expenditures, which is when you uh, get, a, you don't pay taxes as a form of payment right. for doing certain things. They want to re-examine those ones that benefit the wealthy and protect those that help working families. These are the kind of things in the framework for tax reform, which was released in a press conference on December 1st. I looked up the media mentions of that in the last yeah. few days. Zero. 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 Um, I've talked on this show and written in Nygaard Notes, nygaardnotes.org, uh, <laughs> um, about the people's budget, which was proposed in 2011 by the CPC, uh, an alternative budget, uh, alternative certainly to the Ryan budget, which yeah. was we were hearing a lot about, and certainly an alternative to the, uh, yeah. uh, to the president's budget as well. Um, it's now, this, the 2013 budget coming up is now being called the Budget for All, harmonized with deal for all, I think. And uh, it emphasizes job creation, which, again, polls show that is the top priority for the American yeah. people. Yeah. And I don't even use the phrase American people very much because mm -hmm. it usually it's too broad. But really, it's so overwhelming support for job creation. That's the number one point of the, the budget for all. Uh, changing military priorities, health care reform, reform of the government, government itself, uh, in terms of transparency and, and controlling uh, money and stuff like that, stabilizing Social Security and reforming the tax code. Um, you'll never guess in my search for the last three months for mentions in the media of the budget for all, how many uh, articles I found. Oh, let me guess. <laughs> One guess only. Zero. Zero is correct. Yeah. You win. That was my yeah. guess, too. Oh, um, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> I jumped in. So I quicker, know. Yes. Now, I have a shocker for you yeah. because something else I've talked about on this show and in, in the pages of Niagara Notes is something called the Voter Empowerment Act yeah. we've talked about. And that's the, the, an act pr proposed by the Congressional Progressive Caucus, which has been endorsed by, I'll give a little list of who endorses it. But um, again, I just want to, I've said it before, but, but in, in contrast to the various voter identification things aimed supposedly at voter fraud, mm -hmm. uh, the Voter Empowerment Act really addresses some of the issues of, of people who have been, impeded from voting or have had barriers. So it makes uh, it easier to register to vote. It, it increases the opportunities for uh, early voting, uh, absentee voting. Mm -hmm. It makes uh, um, more safeguards for um, electronic um, counting, things like that. The kind of things that really have been problems. Mm -hmm. and, uh, in 2008, uh, I haven't heard about 2012 yet. In 2008, something upwards of 8 million people experienced some degree of difficulty or found it impossible mm -hmm. to vote, including uh, felons who m were not clear whether they're eligible to vote or not, all these kind of things. Right. The Voter Empowerment Act addresses that, and it's, it's endorsed by, I won't even give the whole list, but people like um, uh, American Association of People with Disabilities, the Asian American Justice Center, uh, the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, League of Women Voters, the NAACP, the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials, Educational Fund, Rock the Vote, and on and on and on. Um, now, you'll be shocked at how many 
mentions of mm. this Voter Empowerment Act as even... Your turn. <laughs> you, you, not, it's a trick question this time. Yes. Oh, it is. Oh, oh. it's your turn. Mm. It's actually Juan. This oh. time. There, well, yeah, I know, I was mentioned in the Washington yeah. Post on November 9th. I toward yeah. the end of an article on the inside pages, but still right. it was mentioned. Yeah. Um, but I think... You know what is mentioned over and over and over is Boehner saying... We can't House Speaker the, John Boehner. Is it House Speaker John Boehner? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can't tax the wealthy because that will, you know, uh, prevent job growth. Exactly. Right? But yes. I mean, that's on yeah. there over and over right. and over. Certain things can be talked about and others can't. And you know, this brings up something uh, we were talking about uh, just yesterday. We had an, an Occupy retreat and. People were talking about a legislative agenda because mm -hmm. people are looking at a lot of on the possibilities state level, yeah. on the state level. Uh -huh. State level, a lot of possibilities. Welfare Rights Committee is talking about a, a raise in the uh, uh, monthly grant, mm -hmm. which hasn't happened again since 1986. Right. In dollar amounts, it's the same as it was 26 years ago, and a lot of other things have gone backwards as well. And now, with democratically controlled legislature and governor, there's some chances for this, and people are talking to some people about that issue and several others. And um, a lot of cynicism was expressed also as to whether anything's ever positive going to come out of the legislature or the electoral work or, or, or that kind of avenue. And one of the things that was talked about was, well, you know, at least there are some legislators who are taking up a couple of these issues, who are talking about it. And, well, how much is that going to do? Are they going to really fight for it? Is it all going to disappear somewhere in conference committee or whatever else? But one of the benefits of having someone in the legislature stand up and say, this is what we should be doing, is that it opens up the dialogue so that now you have somebody in a position of some respect mentioning it, which opens up the debate. This is now a part of the respectable right. debate. Right. Because as we've talked so many times on this show, if it isn't, you know, one of the two sides of an issue that are come out with the Democrats and Republicans, it isn't talked about at all. Exactly. Yeah. Our, our, our focus is so narrow on the, the things that are being pushed by various elites mm -hmm. that ideas that are even popular sometimes with the majority of people never even get yeah. discussed because... Why discuss them? They aren't on the table. Right. You exactly. Know, and so some people are putting this on the table. Mm -hmm. But now, I mean, I listen to this makes me think, well, maybe that hopefulness is misplaced mm -hmm. because while here you have in the Congress, some of these ideas are being brought up by a, by a caucus of 80 people, no less. Mm -hmm. This is, what, a third of the um, Democratic representatives in Congress? And it still yeah. isn't right. mentioned right. in the right. public debate. It still isn't one of the options even on the table. These proposals that yeah. they're talking about are not one of the ways in which we could avoid the fiscal cliff right. or live with the fiscal cliff or whatever else it may be. Yeah. And so, here's, here's and where this I... this definitely includes public television. I want oh, to add absolutely. that. Yes, oh, yeah. it does. It's yes, so, it does. I tend to talk they about interview newspapers. the people on the two sides <sighs> of the issue. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, That's or it. whatever, but there's right. a lot leaning right, right uh -huh. on the public. Oh, right. geez, yes. yes. But right. this is one of the things I, I talk to about um, uh, with activists about Whatever your issue, what I'd like to say is, whatever your issue is that you're working on, your second issue should be media, yeah. because that's if we if we're going to have any sort of voice, um, we need to build uh, the, the consciousness that things are possible. Right. And and the the, the way things enter go from the uh, right. dinner, dinner table conversation, mm -hmm. the way they enter into the public discussion, as Dave said, as when they get on the table, is through yeah. the media. And yeah. so I think yeah. we need a media strategy that takes, at this moment in particular, where, where there's been a great deal of, of um, public relations energy expended on the part of the corporate class yeah. to tamp down expectations from this election, oh, yeah. even though there was some discernible, uh, you could call it a mandate, not, not a mandate to an individual, but a mandate away from the austerity uh, mentality of the hard right yes. to say, you know, saying, no, no, we want something different. Uh, this yeah. is, and, and there's even, like Dave said, on the state level, and certainly, as I've said, on the federal level also, there are actually people in positions of authority, elected officials, who are moving in that direction, not with everything we want, but, but, but it's things that we could support, uh, protection of entitlement programs, expansion of welfare benefits, things like this. Um, but it's up to us 
to demand, if, if nobody ever hears about them, except this the people who come to our uh, assemblies and our rallies, which are unfortunately not too numerous sometimes, mm -hmm. if that's if we're limited to that and we don't get something in the media, mm -hmm. and I think there are strategies to do that, letter writing campaigns, coordinated uh, 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 media committees that actually develop relationships with local reporters and say, we, w here's why it's worth your while to cover these things. Mm -hmm. Building these kind of relationships and having this, um, because this is a moment, and we all, people who watch the show know that I'm not the one that's going to argue that, that revolutionary change is going to come through the ballot box. However, uh, at a moment like this where there is some space, a little bit mm -hmm. of space opened up, a little bit of momentum possible, mm -hmm. our job is to jump on that and ride it as far as it'll go and then push it further. Mm -hmm. And then the, the next time around, it's not necessarily the next time isn't the next election, but the next time there's a movement in, in consciousness, we want to be at, the, at when, when people get disgusted with whatever happens next, and they will, uh, oh, yeah. We want to be in a position where when people turn away from what they're seeing on their television sets, they turn towards something that's not the Tea Party, it's something right. else. Well, uh, and something that they've even heard of. Exactly. exactly. Alternatives and possibilities that they've even heard of. And right. at this point, I'm not expecting the, the uh, corporate media to ever, you know, support right. any of these causes, even if, as I say, many of them are majority feelings, tax the rich. Um, you know, keep Social Security safe, mm -hmm. um, universal health care. These are majority positions. Yeah. But for the media to at least mention that these are conceivable ways of mm -hmm. thinking yes. right. would be a huge step forward. Yes. And as I've said on the air numerous times, uh, people need to remember, too, what is the media about? And the media is about selling advertising to the largest, most, well, the, the audience that's going to buy stuff. That, that the advertisers want to reach. So our job at this moment is ultimately to challenge that dynamic. But in the meantime, I think, based on what Dave just said, and I agree with it, some of these things that are being proposed by the DFL majority, the progressive elements in the Minnesota legislature, or the Congressional Progressive Caucus, are actually majority positions. Mm -hmm. And we need to convince media that, uh, despite what you're hearing from your corporate backers, they don't want to hear about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Your readership does want to hear about it. Right. And you, it'll be good for your bottom line right. if you get more information about the, the initiatives that are reflecting, to some extent, popular um, desires and popular aspirations and hopes, mm -hmm. the, the, the hopes right. that people actually, rightly or wrongly, voted for right. in 2008 mm -hmm. and this year. You know, the, not the hopes that we saw, the hopes that yeah. people imagined right. they were voting for. We, right. we have the capacity to build some of that, uh, uh, like Dave said, it, to, to, to bring it into the, the minds of people that there are possibilities there. If you have never yeah. heard of them, mm -hmm. it's, it dampens the imagination, right. the political imagination. Mm -hmm. And so when we go out as organizers and talk to people and say, you know, get behind this, people think we're crazy because they've never heard of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Never yeah. heard of it. I you mean, must no. be making Possibly. that up. I mean, right now yes. when we talk about taxing the rich, we're talking about raising the rate from 35% to 38% or mm -hmm. something like that. And not nobody, even putting it nobody back to the way heard, it was right, it was heard that 10 in the years 50s, ago or something. Well, in the 50s, it was 90%. <laughs> yeah. On the marginal rate, It right. was 90% we for the top then. rate. I mean, and it, it was, didn't seem to kill the economy. No, hardly. No, but of course, that isn't even... You know, considered as a possibility. If no. people even knew that 90% was a possibility yeah. and a historical reality, they might be pushing for maybe 45% yeah. instead of 38. Yes. You know? Speaking it's, of it's, taxes, one of the little yeah. proposals, a modest proposal, yes. I'd like to make, and I'd love to see some uh, activist uh, groups take this on, is starting to demand, uh, in terms of, in interest of full disclosure, when reporters are talking about. Uh, the, the current issue is should taxes be raised on people earning more than $250,000 a year, the top 2% mm -hmm. of income earners. Well, I would suggest that reporters should identify their sources as to where they fall on the income scale. In other words, mm -hmm. if you're talking to a source who is, stands to yeah. pay more right. taxes, they yeah. should be identified as a person who is in the top 2%. Right. Yeah. If, and, and then that also then I think would give uh, reporters and journalists and their editors a right. responsibility to then balance that out by talking to people who are making maybe $20,000. Yeah. Yes. Suddenly maybe people will be coming knocking on my door <laughs> yeah. and say, you know, hey, here's what Mr. Millionaire said. He thought about the tax increase. What do you think about it? <laughs> and that right there, you know, just saying that, that, that right. the, the class location, the social location of sources yes. has a meaning, especially when what we're talking about 
is not it's not literally class it's really just income based that's, that's only one right. part of class right but uh, the idea you know you could say are you gonna there have been there has been talk of, of tax of luxury taxes right. taxing uh, jewelry or taxing uh, non-essential items yachts. As, you know yachts <laughs> things like that yeah. um, would that mean they tax my yacht? Yeah. I, <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. I'm against it. Yeah. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? Or the yeah, the but, idea that, but, that we could push the media not to alter their coverage per se, but just to more clearly identify the sources of who, who they're using for right. sources to comment on the yeah. desirability of tax law. Right. Well, if, what class are you in? If there's a yeah. graduated, somewhat progressive or not progressive tax code, where do you fall? Right. What, what's your interest right. in this? You know, and that would be really interesting too, because sometimes studies are done of sources and how many Democrats and how many Republicans exactly. there are, which sometimes I think isn't a heck of a lot of difference. But if somebody did a study of the sources used by, you know, some media or some particular mm -hmm. commentary show and mm -hmm. rank them on the scale of income <laughs> scale, mm -hmm. I think you'd see yeah. there wouldn't be a balance like there may be, might be between Democrats and Republicans, yeah. but you'd see a huge cluster at the top, and I'll bet you you wouldn't have anybody, probably even below 80%. You know, wow. I mean, the other sources are just not there. They're, you know, I, I had something. I, I yeah, sort of break in here, but I had something from uh, last time around about Occupy Sandy. We, we talk about media misses sometimes, mm -hmm. about things that are done poorly. And here was one that was um, right, oh, a day or two after the storm that this was um, published. And it this was is on. Which storm? Or Sa Sandy? Occ right, Sandy, Hurricane Sandy out east. And it was on Marketplace on NPR, mm -hmm. which of course is again it's a liberal media, right? Yes, liberal media, right? right. Oh. Which talks about Marketplace an awful lot more than it talks about other types of things. But, <laughs> yes. but nevertheless, it was an interesting story because the thrust of the story was storm. Well, the title: storm hits both rich and poor, and it's quite open in the story. They talk about something: the weather is a great leveler. Oh yeah. And so the, the thrust of the story was that, you know, there's pe rich people, poor people, but they're all affected by the storm. And this is marketplace, of course. The interesting thing is that they only talk to the rich people. Right. Or at least those in the top half. I mean, not all of them were rich. They start off with the owner of a local cafe or bar. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. not rich. But certainly, but you know, they talked about, you know, thousands of bottles of wine or something like that in a cellar mm -hmm. being destroyed. That's, you know, you, that's not right. poor. Um, you know, another person... Um, Owens at Brownstone, these, these were in um, Red Hook, which is mm -hmm. actually has a large, I looked it up, a large housing project, very, right. very mm -hmm. poor. Right. But not all of Red Hook is poor, and they, right. they didn't interview anybody from that housing project, that's right. for sure, where people may to this day be still walking up 10 flights yeah. of stairs because they don't have power. Yeah. But, you know, they talked to somebody who owns a Brownstone home, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, who's a payroll coordinator at a law firm. Well, that's not a top position, but it probably puts you in the top 50%. Mm -hmm. And then they talked to the other side, which was oh. a person who owns a public relations firm in Manhattan and lives in Scarsboro. Oh, yeah. So now oh. they had to talk to rich and poor and had decided ah. that, wow, the storm affects everybody and is a great leveler. Yeah. Now, we've had a month since then to look at this, and um, it isn't fair maybe Believe looking back a month later as to what's happened to the rich people and to the poor people mm -hmm. from Sandy. Um, but obviously... The, it has not been a great leveler. Right. The poor who are in their housing projects and elsewhere have suffered tremendously yeah. from this, really having no luck getting any kind of assistance um, and are in awful shape. I'm sure the guy who uh, owns the public relations firm in Manhattan and lives in Scarsdale is probably doing just fine, thank you. Mm -hmm. And we've seen this. I mean, and you don't have to look back now a month later to figure this out. Remember Katrina? Mm -hmm. That was hardly a leveler right. in New Orleans. Right. It greatly impacted the poor people there. And for an article to claim this was like an obvious thing. Mm -hmm. hmm. There it is. Against all history and, of course, their sources. Mm -hmm. yes, their exactly. sources don't stack up as talking. No. It says storm hits both rich and poor. 
but they only talk to one of them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So well, this is the kind of thing and you where, see where consistently. Is that from, uh, it was uh, NPR, um, their oh, yeah, uh, marketplace right. show, yeah. Yeah. and it was um, like two days after the public the radio. storm hit. Right? Years yeah. ago, there was a front page story about tax policy actually yeah. on the front page of the New York Times, and I did a little analysis of it because they well, they took a sort of three case studies talking about the impact of proposed tax. I can't remember when this was, mm -hmm. um, and they had three representative. Uh, Three, three examples of households representing different levels yeah. of income. One was the wealthy, 200 yeah. plus thousand, whatever, at yeah. the time. The other was, um, you know, dual career professional, so it was 100 and something thousand. Yeah. Right. And then the low end was $40,000 a year. Yeah. And oh. I thought, well, that's somewhat lower, yeah. although most of my friends don't get anywhere near $40,000. <laughs> yes. You know, so yeah. again, and I think yeah. they did the best they could, and there was more, you know, there was, mm -hmm. there was a, 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 an acknowledgement that the impact would not be the same on different groups of people. Right. right. But but the just the ability to see and this is this is where when I talk about one of the dynamics in, in journalism over the past hundred years actually has been the professionalization of the of the job. And one of the things that's happened is not only are the agenda setting media uh, being paid a great deal of money, I mean in the tri six figures mm -hmm. for for high end journalists and columnists and editors, but um, also the the, the the route to becoming a journalist is become professionalized. So you yeah. need a degree. You need to go to journalism school. And in the in in when I was coming up, and it's not that long ago, yeah. I hope, um, journalism was still to some extent a trade. That is, you could it was the kind of job you could start as a copy aide or start as a delivery person, stay around and work your way up until you became you know you got a job covering obituaries or something, and then you next thing you know you had a beat somewhere and you became a journalist. Yeah, right. Be and it was a trade, and you you brought with your with you uh, those those values that that come with with that, and and you would you would have hung out with and know people who are below forty thousand dollars or are not the owner of the public relations firm or whatever it is. Yeah. So it, you would just in the in the course of doing things, the sources and context you would have would be more rooted in a cross section of the community, and you'd get different uh, voices heard. That's been lost to a large extent, uh, right. not only by professionalization of the media, but as newsrooms get cut back, uh, which we've talked about a yeah. lot on this show, yeah. uh, um, this, as the staff gets cut back, uh, more and more smaller papers, especially like our local papers, depend for national and international news on the big boys, and I do mean boys mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. most part, uh, and the New York Times, the networks to some extent, uh, the Wall Street Journal, places like that. So then you get stories like that right, yeah. on, on Marketplace. Right. Now sometimes, uh, some stories of course come from uh, sources who have done scientific studies or, or studies at you know, university professors right. and of course, and from politicians who rep or all you know, come from a higher income and education scale and all that kind of stuff. So it's very hard to get away from that you know, source bias in that sense. But one should still recognize it Mm -hmm. that even university professors who do independent, unbiased studies ha may, have a, may actually have a bias right. when they present those yeah. studies. Um, but a lot of stories do have um, anecdotal or man on the street kind of thing like that. And it would be possible to find folks like this. I'm just sure. thinking of when I was you know, a candidate for city council and I went door knocking. It was very interesting. I learned a tremendous amount by going door knocking and people had stories to tell and stories that had real political impact that right. had a, a point to them not just their own personal story right. but the 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 things that they had experienced you know from city government or from other things like that and it was very different in fact in the in the poorer neighborhoods people were more interested and open to talking about that. First of all, nobody had ever come to their door before and asked their opinion right, about anything. Right. You know, the media has a golden opportunity there right. of people who would be happy to talk to them. But it is a different perspective and it's something you will never find in the media. There were a number of issues where, you know, you just see in the media all the time, well, everybody is, is satisfied with such and such or everybody's glad that such and such right, happened right. or whatever else. And you discover, well, no, not actually. <laughs> right, it's right. not that way. Mm -hmm. And right. But until you go around and talk to people, you might not know that. And I've been at meetings where um, people have said, well, there hasn't been any, well, that, that's worked out really well. Everybody, this is, this is great. Mm -hmm. And say, well, 
No, not mm -hmm. everybody thinks mm -hmm. that. But if you just read the stories in the paper, I can understand why you would think that everybody thinks this is a great thing. And even uh, when you, I'll just digress for just a brief moment, mm -hmm. is even one of the ways that I think media like to think they're letting people know what people want is through opinion polls. Yeah. Gallup and Harris and the mm -hmm. well-known ones, and who everybody does their own poll now, New York Times and ABC and CBS. Um, but it, I've done a little writing about, uh, go, to, go to the internet and search for Nygaard Notes mm -hmm. opinion polls. Yes. Um, because there, there's a lot of, I wouldn't even call it bias as much as um, there's a framing that happens. Right. One of the classic examples, it illustrates it really clearly, is the question that uh, Gallup, I used to be a Gallup polar, I think uh. I've said that um, years ago. And one of the questions we would ask is, um, um, which of the following is your top priority? Which of the following oh, issues yes, is your top right. priority? And then you give a list of 10 or 8 yeah, or right. 6 or 12, whatever it was. Yeah. And right there, in the very framing of the question, you're asked to say one is more important than another. So what are you going to say? Healthcare is more important than than yeah. childcare. Yeah. I mean, is more important than education. Yeah. I mean, what do you mean? Yeah. I mean, right. most, most people don't see it that way. They're, right. they're, they're raising kids. They've got you know, they, transportation is important to them. Right. Education is important to them. Mm -hmm. Certainly, yes. jobs are important to them. Taxes are important to them. Yeah. Which is the most important? Well, how do you answer that question? Yeah. Right. And then so we see, we think we ask these questions, kind of force people right. to make these artificial right. choices right. between. Issues on a list that uh, they didn't even make. Right. And what you're talking about, Dave, is is the kind of thing where I think, again, it takes it would take more resources than our current cash-strapped yeah. media have. But when you really just go and ask people, not multiple choice questions. Right. But just what do you think I should be paying attention to if I represent you? Yeah. And see what people say. Wow. Yes. And you get an airflow. Hey, yeah, I was a cash-strapped candidate. You know, right, it can exactly. be done. Right. Even by the cash-strapped. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But right, it's true because very often those polls are designed to, not necessarily consciously designed to elicit certain types of answers, but they anticipate only certain types of responses. Exactly. I'm sure they're not vetted ahead of time with much more open-ended things to see, well, no. what would somebody put on that list or well, what would one, somebody say? One person in White Bear Lake was called to participate in a poll and had to had to answer four or five questions and if they didn't know the answers to these four or five questions they yeah. couldn't participate oh, in the right? poll. Oh really? Well, that's, that's a new one. Yeah, yeah. one of them was, huh. you know, who yeah. who is the leader of the house. If they right. didn't know John Maynard's name, they couldn't yeah. uh -huh. they couldn't participate yeah. oh, in the yeah. poll. Yeah. Oh, on and on. And you so may you know that a sorts whole it out lot about a some very important things without knowing John Boehner's name. Yes. Right. To a certain class of people, yes. knowing the name of the right. majority leader in the house yes. is really important. Right. But to another class of people, that yes. doesn't really touch so on the it issues they're thinking out. about. Right. Right. Interesting. Yeah, yeah that is mm -hmm. interesting. interesting. There's yeah. the class bias there, I think, too. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I'm sure there is. Sure there I just is. want to say a couple things too about we, we. I started out talking about the how we heard so much about the fiscal cliff after the right. election. We're still hearing about the fiscal yeah, cliff. I and, and again, I think I said this yeah. last on the last show, but um, there is no such thing. Right. Yes. I mean, the, the phrase was coined or brought into popular use. I think it was last February of 2012 uh, by Ersk, uh, not Erskine Polls. Yeah. <laughs> That's a different high Yeah, but guy. we will get there. About uh, Ben Bernanke, the, the, right. yes. the chair of the Federal Reserve, he mentioned in a speech, used the term fiscal cliff, which is supposed to refer to this, it does refer to this December 31st, yeah. the end of this month, um, date when, without congressional action, a bunch of tax cuts uh, are rescinded or, or um, just stop. Uh, run out, and uh, also some s automatic spending cuts kick in. Well, this f and the, the reality is the reason I say it doesn't exist is yeah. none of that's going to happen on January 1st. No. Um, what will happen is that the payroll tax uh, moratorium, which is real, right. you will notice that your first check, right. it won't be the first, right. your first check will be the middle of the month or right. whenever it is, and then some of these other things, uh, spending cuts and things like that, those are all in the pipeline. They wouldn't even be implemented for months or maybe a, a year, year or more. So the, there will be time after the first of the year, after December 31st, to make whatever changes need to be made and to revise, because this fiscal cliff was not, it's not a natural phenomenon. No. A cliff was made by nature and it's there. Yeah. Uh, uh, this fiscal cliff is, is a result of, of a negotiated legislative right. initiative, right. which I won't even go into that. Right. But it, the point is it was, it was constructed by legislators and can be changed by legislators. Right. The reason it's being uh, portrayed uh, I believe, yes. uh, and the media doesn't, 
I, the media is culpable by just, they never say, they rarely say, sometimes you'll hear so-called fiscal cliff, but you often yeah. it's just, it's just referred to as, it's, just take it's, whatever term to, they it's, use. it's there to create there a sense of emergency, yeah. so right. people will think they have to decide something quickly, and anybody who's in their personal life had, a, had to make a really serious health care decision or employment decision in a big hurry knows that that's not when you're thinking your best. No. When you're really under pressure and you think it's an emergency, you, you, you just, right. you freak out and make some bad right. decisions mm -hmm. and you, you're sometimes willing to swallow things that you wouldn't if you had a little time to reflect on it. Right. That's the point. Right. That's yes. why right. we're being told it's an emergency. There is no emergency in that sense because we have time. If we did go a full year from now and hadn't resolved it, that right. would be a big right. deal. And budgets have been done by crisis for quite a while now. Oh, yeah. This wasn't the first fiscal cliff we engaged yeah, in. We, know. You know, if we didn't raise the debt ceiling by such and such a date, you know, disaster would happen. So we have to have a budget like right now right. in the state legislature. We go right down to the very end of the term and then we still don't have it. So we have to have a special session and we have one day in which to right. do the budget. And <laughs> yeah. when, you, when you govern by crisis like that, things become acceptable that wouldn't be acceptable otherwise. Mm. And that's quite the point because these budget proposals they come up in the, with in the end are not acceptable to no. the majority of the population. They say, what? How come we're the, always oh, the ones right. that are getting cut? Right. And, and, you and notice, we are. And, therefore, and you notice one of the reasons that it's true is, of course, that, that usually when it's under an emergency uh, scenario, what will happen is the details will be negotiated usually in private, oh, behind yes. closed doors, and then there will be an up and down vote Right. So we don't even know what's in it until after it's passed. Right. Well, if, because if we knew what was in it, we right. might have something to say about it. And in right. fact, what I want to stress too is for people who have really been relying on the corporate media to hear about the fiscal cliff or the so-called grand bargain that's being talked about where we lose and people with money win, <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. um, right. uh, that grand bargain is being negotiated for the most part out of sight. And yes. it's, it's a very dangerous yes. situation. And I j in that context, I want to say mm. the basis for that grand bargain, some people may have, if they're following it, might have heard of something called the Erskine Bowl. It's called the Erskine Bowles Commission. I think it was really called the National Commission to Reduce the Deficit or something right, like yes. that. But it, people know it as Erskine Bowles. And people hear about something. I, I just saw this in the paper a couple of days ago. Uh, that there's been a reference to the Erskine Bowles Commission report. Yeah. There was an Erskine Bowles Commission, and the chair mm -hmm. people were um, um, Erskine. What's Erskine's first name? It's Alan Simpson, and uh, it, it's the Simpson Bowles. Erskine Bowles is his ah. name. It's Simpson Erskine Bowles. Bowles. That's right. what I'm Simpson saying. Bowles, I'm sorry. Right. It's the Simpson Bowles Commission. Simpson Bowles recommendations. Right. Um, Alan Simpson and Erskine Bowles right. are the chairs. When the commission uh, uh, concluded its deliberations about two years ago, in December of 2010, there was no recommendation because they couldn't reach they the did, mandated right. supermajority. Uh, so what happened was five different plans to reduce the deficit came out of there from different members of the commission, including the aforementioned Jan Schakowsky, who I mentioned earlier, who was on the uh, Progressive Caucus, but also the two chair people, uh, Alan Simpson and Erskine Bowles, got together and they released their own recommendation, which right. is just those two guys. Right. Uh, it's not the commission right. report. There is no commission report. And I can't stress that enough because um, the, the hard-headed and adult and all the positive right. adjectives to the, of the, the Simpson-Bowles recommendations are, are the, grand, the basis for the grand bargain we've been yes, told right. is being negotiated. And uh, I just encourage people to um, get away from the corporate media on this and go to your search engine on your internet and look for uh, um, alternative ideas for, or look for grand bargain, bad deal, or look for <laughs> grand bargain, uh, mm -hmm. people's budget or something and see what the options are because uh, what we're being told are being, uh, the options are very limited and they involve yes. shared sacrifice mm -hmm. and again, um, get very nervous when you hear the phrase shared sacrifice. Or right. balanced. Balanced. That right. Right. Uh, yeah. the, the, it's, it's a tricky territory yeah. and I think the, uh, the crisis atmosphere that's surrounding it is really um, uh, another, I usually have a media hit and a media miss every oh, week. Yes, yeah. I guess I have two misses this yeah. month because yeah. uh, the first one is the Congressional Progressive Caucus and the alternative budget proposals. The, all the coverage about coverage. the fiscal cliff is uh, yeah is really a miss, That's I think, right. because mm -hmm. it, yeah. the, 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 the reporting that fails to challenge, you know, just day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis, the idea of an emergency, the idea of a, of a yeah. cliff, 
right. you know, is really irresponsible yeah. reporting and really leading us down a dangerous yeah. path, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I've been thinking this month about the words that get used, and you talk about mm -hmm. that fiscal cliff, are very important. And one of the mm -hmm. ones I'm thinking about with this is entitlements. Absolutely. Entitlements oh, are that one. When did entitlements become a bad right, right. thing? Wow, those are the things. We've got to start looking at these entitlements. Right. And you hear this from both sides now. Right. And I'm thinking back to the original meaning of the word. Entitlements are things that you deserve, it's things right. that you did. I mean, for instance, like if I go and pay for a car, I am entitled to that car. In, yes. fact, right. in fact, I own the title to the car, <laughs> which is where the word came from in the first place. Uh, that, yes. I mean, that's the derivation yeah. of the word. Right. You yeah. have title to it. You own it. You deserve it. You earned it. Right. Social Security, you've been paying in, and you've been paying in based on this is what you expect to get at the end. Mm -hmm. um, other entitlements are in law, but you know when you have a legal right to something, Mm -hmm. You have a legal right to something, and the mm -hmm. idea that, well, you're you're just feeling entitled. Well, mm -hmm. actually, you entitled. are. <laughs> entitled. How did yeah. how did this become mm -hmm. a bad word? Mm -hmm. But this mm -hmm. is part of what drives this, and mm -hmm. you know, through um, folks like Ben Bernanke or politicians, and echoed by the media, we come to look upon these terms in ways that are just like, what? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it just doesn't make sense, it's but. And we are, and that it affects how we can even think about things. Well, I think it's really illustrated, and I'll say just a word about Social Security, yeah. which isn't on our agenda, but I yeah, will but say something about it. We'll say more about Social mm -hmm. Security, I think, as we go along, because that's one of the major entitlements. Yes. And I've really, I've heard just in the last week or two, I've heard a number of people arguing with the idea, it's not even an idea, to me it's a fact, that mm -hmm. Social Security has nothing to do with the deficit. Right. It's a dedicated mm -hmm. fund. Let me just say, again, I've said this a billion times, but people get really confused. Social Security is designed as an insurance program. The premiums, or the, the, the payroll taxes we pay this month right. are being spent this month to pay benefits to people who are retired, disabled, who, who, who are dependents right. of people right. who are bed bedwinners, children. Right. Um, okay. And then when we become those people, yes. when we become retired or if we have a, become disabled or if, we, or, or if well, we, we're too old to be, we're not kids anymore. Right, yes, but, that but is Survivors, like that, yes. people with disabilities and retirees, right. If, right. when we fall into those classes, then the people working at that point right. will pay our benefits. That's right. the nature, of, it's a contract right. between the generations. Right. And, as a, and that's another word you don't hear much in terms of Social Security, is contract. Contracts mm -hmm. imply uh, you, you contract with somebody and then you are entitled yes. to the thing you've contracted for. Right. And they are entitled. Contracts are enforced. They're, in, they're obligated yes. to fulfill the terms of the contract. Right. And, the, and, and both sides are, are entitled to the rights uh, spelled out in the contract. Mm -hmm. That's how Social Security works. There's, there's something, what's wrong with an entitlement? But you're right, right. it's become a pejorative term yeah. in the public discussion. And that's not the media's fault that, that there are professional propagandists working to make that happen. Yes, right. But the media, to the extent that they play along with that and just report Happily it as entitlement, along, right. then I think the media has a responsibility right. to challenge some of these things which are just conceived and executed as propaganda terms right. and nothing else. Mm -hmm. right. um, yeah. The people saying that don't, they know what they're talking about. Right. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, another area where we've had a lot of propaganda mm -hmm. lately, and we've talked about some of these things before is of course the recent uh, uh, war really in Gaza and um, the threatened war in Iran. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's seeming more and more there's some connections there. Very much. But uh, I, I just got a chance to talk a little bit about Gaza uh, last month and some of the propaganda that we receive. And one side is very, very good at propaganda on this and has a lot of um, influence in the U.S. media and the U.S. Congress and everything else, which passed a unanimous resolution supporting Israel's right to self-defense. And over and over, we hear the right to self-defense in terms mm -hmm. of Israel. And this is another term that has a real meaning mm -hmm. and could possibly be applied here, but you begin to wonder, at what point is this a um, one person only has the right to, to self-defense? Because... We're looking at this and what's said over and over again, well, no nation would tolerate mis missiles raining down upon it. You know, for years and years, right. missiles, hundreds, thousands of missiles raining down upon it. What is not talked about here is the effect of those missiles and what's happening on the other side. 
And I mentioned last time that by one accounting, and of course you can count things a little bit differently, but between Operation Cast Lead, which was the last time Israel had a major, major military impact upon Gaza, that was almost exactly four years ago. Mm -hmm. It was at the end of 2008, 2008 beginning of 2009. Mm -hmm. Right. Between that time and almost four year period, and between this, three people were killed in Israel by those missiles. Yes, there's many missiles raining down. They mostly fall harmlessly in the desert. They don't have much range. They aren't set off with any kind of precision or anything else like that. Now, obviously, um, nobody wants missiles raining down, even if they usually are largely ineffective. But what is not looked at the other side? What happened, what happened in Gaza during that time? And here are statistics from the United Nations for just one of those four years, 2011. Keeping in mind that 2012, the year when there was this great increase in the missiles and we can no longer tolerate this and, and you know, they talked about the buildup of these missile attacks and the, you know, escalation of attacks. In, 20, in the year 2012, by all accountings, not a single person in Israel was killed by mm -hmm. those missiles. Um, but here's UN statistics for just one year, 2011, the last year for which there's a full year of statistics, mm -hmm. of course, says in... 2011, the projectiles fired by the Israeli military into Gaza, so it's pretty much a, you know, mm -hmm. opposite here, have been responsible for the death of 108 Palestinians. Hmm. 35 times as many people as were killed in three or four years of missiles going the other way. 15 were women or children. Injury of 468 Palestinians. Again, many women and children. The methods by which these casualties were inflicted by Israeli projectiles breaks down as follows. 57% or 310, well this is casualty injuries and deaths, but 57% Israeli aircraft missile fire, something of course the Palestinians have no capability of doing, of flying yeah, over Israel yeah. and, oh. and dropping bombs. 28% were from Israeli live ammunition, so bullets fired across the bullet, border. 11% from Israeli tank shells, and 3% finally from Israeli mortar fire. Mm -hmm. This is, apparently doesn't give the Palestinians any right to self-defense. Right. So these terms of self-defense are really, uh, I could cite a lot more statistics right. and tell a lot more about what's happened in Gaza during this time. The sanctions on Gaza, the, the cro closing of the border, for instance, um, the deaths from that are far greater. 10% of the children under five have stunted growth in Gaza. Stunted growth is a result of severe malnutrition mm -hmm. and it's something that follows you for your entire life. In fact, usually mental development is, is affected more than the physical stunting. I just want to mention yeah. something in terms of what you said, that one of the people who said, I can almost quote him, uh, it was President Obama, who said in relation to the Gaza, missiles from Gaza flying into Israel, he said, no nation would tolerate missiles being fired on it from outside of its borders. Yes. Yeah. This was not, aroused no irony in the media. Yes, I yes, know. When I the know. Man there is no sense of it, irony. Yes. The man who said it is sometimes called the, the drone president yes. for ordering repeatedly right. missile attacks across right. the border into countries with which we're not at war. Yes, yes. exactly. And there's no sense of irony. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's how the media can normalize a oh, very, very... Um, what, would, what yeah. would seem to be a very obvious irony that it would, would arouse your interest, it passes without comment. I didn't think, right. the, only, the only reason I even noticed it actually was in, the, and I want to recommend one a couple of readings about Israel and Gaza just yes. for a different perspective. Oh, good, yes. One is from a group called War Times, Tiempo de Guerra. Oh, yes, right. Um, they, good, yes. they had a piece just recently called Settler States and the Shatter Belt. And a yeah. Shatter Belt refers to a, a region where uh, it's so, uh, it's, it marks the, the nexus between an air power and a sea power, and the Middle yeah. East is one of those shatter points yeah. where uh, a, even a small nation, it's so delicately balanced, a small nation changing its allegiance can throw the whole thing mm -hmm. into turmoil. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, she, and this woman r r writing about it in War Times uh, goes into that, um, and it's, it's a very good piece to, to see the larger context for the, for the conflict. That's one of the ones I wanted to recommend. Um, that's all I'll say for now. Yeah, okay. but there's, you know, there's a lot else. I mean, the control of the borders in terms of food. Um, it's come out fairly recently 
um, what has been known all along is that the government of Israel calculated how much calories are needed by the population mm -hmm. of Gaza to survive, mm -hmm. not to, you know, the calories that people would normally and then consume. Cut it down. And they literally said, we're going to put Gaza on a diet. That's right. And once they calculated that, they allowed in significantly less than that even. Yeah. So this is, this is quite a situation. And it goes on. Fortunately, there is a ceasefire. It seems to be holding to some extent. However, some of the terms are already being violated. We've just heard in the last few days, one of the terms was that um, people in Gaza would be allowed to fish six kilometers out from their thing. Not the normal, you know, that any other nation would be allowed to, but Israel allows them to fish mm -hmm. off their own borders six kilometers. Well, after two days, Israel Navy started firing on the fishing boats um, with rather disastrous effect. People were allowed to farm all the way up to the border instead of this large strip. I mean, like a third of Israel, uh, Gaza agricultural land is not available for farming because Israel considers it a zone that they need for their, you know, safety. So um, some of these things are being broken. I, I really hope that, you know, a ceasefire holds and that, uh, you know, there isn't a resumption of the hostilities. People who watch this later on in the month will know more than we do now about how all this works. But this also goes towards um, the issue with Iran and the threats that are being um, directed against Iran. And here's another place where a word that's being used, and I, it's just recently I realized um, it's, we've been talking for years about diplomacy versus war on Iran. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Obama's praised for using a diplomatic thing, or he's urged to use diplomatic means rather than um, military means. and. One of the prime yeah. things that's been included constantly under diplomacy is sanctions. Right. And the interesting thing, this yeah. applies even when those sanctions... are alternative to military attack. Right, right. And it's, it's considered diplomacy even when those sanctions yeah. are openly talked about as crippling sanctions. Punishing now, when sanctions. I think of diplomacy, the original meaning of the term, again, like entitlements, the original meaning of the term, yeah. diplomacy is coming to agreements. Mm -hmm. Now, those agreements may be based on differential amounts of power, but they're negotiated agreements. Yeah. If I'm at a table negotiating with someone and they kick me in the leg to the point I'm crippled, I wouldn't think that's very diplomatic. Right. You know, and that is what's going on in the case of Iran. Iran has never agreed to these sanctions. This is not diplomacy. This is war by another means. Mm -hmm. And we, Jeff and I have both been looking They've into... They've done nothing aggressive. <coughs> yeah. Right. No, no, they have not had any aggression outside their borders in a long, long time. Um, but we've been looking to find, so what are the effect of the sanctions? We've, we've heard about them a lot. We hear the crippling sanctions. But inside Iran, what's mm -hmm. really happening? Now, the economy has been apparently quite greatly affected. And there's been a few people talking about it. Um, Wham and their latest uh, Women Against Military Madness. Yeah, well, these and their are, this latest, is alternative um, media, of um, course. News, uh, yes, very alternative. Mm -hmm. um, and their latest uh, November newsletter talks some about the effects. The um, Well, one of the things we've done, waging a cyber war against Iran. The Stuxnet virus, and I've heard this other places, has shut down a considerable portion of Iran's civilian nuclear program and infected infrastructure activities, including power plants, oil rigs, and water supplies. Yeah. This is a computer virus which we've unleashed upon yeah. them. Everybody knows that the U.S. or Israel or somebody supported by us has been killing Iranian nuclear scientists. That's an act of war, obviously, mm -hmm. targeting people in foreign countries. Um, they, the United States has been funding terrorist groups against Iran. There um, are clearly... Um, a lot of effects of these sanctions, um, one of the major ones is uh, shortages of medicine and yeah. health care. And that leads to real deaths. I mean, we don't know how many mm -hmm. people have died. It's, as I say, it's very, very hard to find the information on this. I, I think can, you found a few There's things, a few things you? from the corporate media. Um, one is, uh, an, I'll just, make, just quote a few of them. We have a few minutes left. Yeah. Um, there was an a article in June by Nicholas Kristof in the New York Times. The title was, Pinched and griping in Iran, oh. mm. largely because of Western griping. sanctions. Oh, thank you. Factories are closing, workers are losing their jobs, trade is faltering, and prices are surging. This is devastating to the average Iranian's pocketbook. Mm -hmm. Pocketbook. Um, mm -hmm. Living under Life. siege in Iran. <laughs> yeah. um, repeatedly, this is um, 
from July 11th, and I didn't write down the name of the newspaper. Repeatedly, we were told that there was a shortage of many foreign drugs because of the sanctions, even though the West's punitive measures don't directly target supplies such as medicines. A Gallup poll carried out earlier this year showed almost half of Iranians didn't have enough money to buy food their families needed at times during the past year. That proportion has tripled the figure when the first UN sanctions on Iran over its nuclear program were adopted in 2006. Near the end of a major front page story in the New York Times of February 7th, it says the crisis, meaning sanctions, has taken a toll on medical care, affecting the middle class as well as the poor. Uh, and here something hits close to home. The black market price of Herceptin, a breast cancer drug, has nearly mm -hmm. doubled in the past year. Um, I say that hits close to home because mm -hmm. my partner had breast cancer and she was treated with Herceptin. Oh, wow. And is likely alive today in part because of that. Had she been, mm -hmm. we been living in Iran, she might not be. Uh -huh. Because radiation, radiology machines fall under the dual use provisions of the laws aimed at keeping nuclear technology out of Iran, at Shohada Hospital, one of the country's premier institutions, about 1,200 cancer patients a year go without radiological treatment mm -hmm. because the equipment is no longer working and replacement car parts cannot be brought in. Uh, electric rates have gone up, the p Iranian currency has plunged, staggering inflation, um, blah, 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 um, millions of lives are at risk in Iran. This is from uh, The Guardian. Millions of lives are at risk in Iran because Western economic sanctions are hitting the importing of medicines and hospital equipment, the country's top medical charity has warned. Earlier this month, it emerged Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the United Nations, had warned the UN in a report that humanitarian operations in Iran were being harmed because of sanctions. Officials here estimate that potentially about six million patients, many of them with cancer, are affected by the shortages. On and on and on. But none of these are feature stories. None of these no. are in the lead. No. These we, are, we had to really look to find oh, what little we have. I mean, we, and we're pretty good at finding zero, things. Right. You know, right. this program. But so it is yeah. mentioned. But I, but the the uh, idea that and and it should be stressed too that. Mm -hmm. The United States has been imposing sanctions, and the West, mm -hmm. been imposing sanctions on Iran since the revolution in 1979. Mm -hmm. There's been more or less continuous sanctions mm -hmm. on some level. They've been ratcheted up, but it's not a new phenomenon. And uh, sanctions are, in every case, as, as a report in the New England Journal of Medicine put it in 1997, economic sanctions are, at their core, a war against public health. Right. Here, and, there's an excellent article here. When will the killing war in Iran begin? And it says it already has, right. and through these sanctions it has, and yeah. so I, I think that. that's important that we are already at war. And Where by is that all from? terms of uh, global research, right. Stephen yes. Gowans, okay. by all terms of international law, yes, we are at war. Mm -hmm. These are acts of war against a foreign nation, and they are meant to eventually cause regime change. Back in Chile mm -hmm. in 1973, the term was "make the economy scream." And that oh, was a yeah. U.S. policy right. that was right. sanctions like that. And it led, in 73, to Chile being weakened to the point where a, a military coup threw, overthrew Allende and established Pinochet with yeah. disastrous results yeah. for that country right. for a long time. Here's some music. Here's yep. some music. <laughs> so it's that's, the end of the show. Right, that's the end of the show for this Thank year. Thank you, great show. 2013 will be here we'll on the well, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. on to the new year. See you next right. year. In the news. Thank you. <laughs>